Good afternoon, viewers. Uh, welcome to UCCC. Today, as part of uh, larger lecture series, Global Environmental Conflict, we will be having a discussion on uh, human nature, human uh, wildlife conflict. And to discuss the issue, we have our expert, Colonel Pranay Chandra with us. Colonel Chandra has a tremendous field experience where he has been negotiating with the actual life situation of conflict between human and wildlife. So what we today intend to do, have a discussion on various themes related to human wildlife conflict. And our purpose is to make you aware that it has never been in inevitable. There has been a long tradition in industry where we have been, humans have been living in harmony with the nature, in harmony with the wildlife. There are certain changes, certain historical factors which have changed the situation. And Colonel Pranachandra will be focusing primarily on the contemporary situations in what ways it has been creating problems for humans as well as for wildlife and for the environment in totality. Along with that, he also expertises in on the issue of mitigation, how to reduce the animal wildlife conflict. And especially in the context of when there is a, a real life situation where wild has entered into human settlement or there is an immediate conflict going on, then what are the precautionary measures which should be taken to secure human life as well as the wildlife. So now let me once again welcome Colonel Pranay Chandra and to begin the discussion, let me ask you, sir, is it, what is human wildlife conflict? How do you see human wildlife conflict? Uh, human wildlife conflict is a basically an interaction of uh, animals with the uh, humans and which results into any negative impact uh, which can be on human or it can be on wildlife. Right. And uh, so when this the human and wildlife come into the contact and this conflict starts, this is known as the human wildlife conflict. And perhaps that is, there is a slide for that also. She has given the definition of that. So a slide can be uh, displayed for that. The next question which we discuss is the is it inevitable the human wildlife conflict because as I have been trying to argue in my previous lectures and this as a part of this series we have been trying to discuss that human uh, were never not always in conflict with the nature. This conflict has emerged over centuries. So can we say the same for the human wildlife conflict also is it inevitable or there are uh, other traditions where the, this in inevitability is a product of uh, modern day situation. Uh, human wildlife conflict uh, has been there right from the very beginning mm -hmm. and uh, human wildlife will continue to stay okay uh, because humans and wildlife both are the stakeholders of the land and uh, human uh, wildlife conflict as you have rightly said is inevitable which will continue okay so, do you see what are the primary reasons for this in inevitability? Because in ancient time we have a tradition of, in religious traditions we have Ganesh, Hanuman, Garun, etc. etc. long tradition. Along with that we have Jatak Kathai, where uh, uh, the whole uh, animal world, whole natural world was personified. It was humanized and there was a long tradition of coexistence between human and animals. Where and how do you see there is a rupture between that, that coexistence? What are the factors? Because as we were discussing uh, while we were coming to this place, that there are other reasons, uh, growth of population, mass industrialization, urbanization. So how do you place them? What are your uh, take on the issue of human wildlife conflict and its inevitability at the moment? Okay. Uh, basically, you want to know the factors which are governing the human wildlife conflict. Yes, precisely, right. sir. Okay. So the main and the most important uh, factor is uh, economic development. Okay. Uh, Economic development as a sense that the as and when our civilization is growing and as and when our uh, any development is taking place, whether it is taking place in terms of road communication or whether it is taking uh, in terms of urbanization, whether it is taking terms in terms of industrialization. So what it happens in this all this thing growth takes place at the expense of the forest land. Okay. Uh, as a result, there is a uh, shrinking of the forest. So that is number one. 
कि दैट श्रिंकिंग ऑफ द फॉरेस्ट सेकेंड थिंग इज कि आर फॉरेस्ट हैज बिकम वेरी फ्रैगमेंटेड द कंप्लीट फॉरेस्ट हैज बीन नाउ डिवाइडेड इन टू स्मॉल 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 पॉकेट्स एंड एज अ रिजल्ट देर इज नॉट अ कंटिन्यूस लॉन्ग बेल्ट ऑफ फॉरेस्ट एंड एनिमल्स will come out because they don't have the shoulders place they don't have the place to move about in the forested land so they will spill over and they will come out of that protected area and as soon as they come out of that protected area or the forested area uh, into the uh, civilized uh, uh, so called civilized yes. or the human populated area there will be a conflict, conflict. Exactly. so that is number 2 uh number third reason which i attribute is uh, that off late uh, since last one decade or so uh, especially so after uh, we suddenly heard and saw that we lost out all the tigers in sariska uh, the lot of impetus has gone towards the conservation effort and uh, all the agencies have worked together and as a result there has been a rebound of the wildlife into the uh, our um, uh, surroundings mm. uh, which we which i had not seen a decade back mm. which is uh, now very widely seen whether it is sikkim or it is uh, um, um, sundarbans or it can be central forest or it can central india forest or it can be termed as south india forest mm. that the wildlife is very much visible mm. earlier it was not that visible so what has happened is that the conservation efforts by the government and the concerned officials and the ngos as well and as well as the general uh, support yeah. of the people uh, has been a true success right and these animals which which are now in those small little fragmented areas mm. uh, have become overpopulated Right. and now once they will become overpopulated so then they will spill out and when they will spill out again there will be a conflict conflict right which means you are trying to suggest that uh, there are few primary reasons and then few unintended reasons hmm. what i can get from your uh, argument is precisely that there were primary reasons urbanization exponential growth of population and uh, industrialization conflict over resources and let me remind the viewers as part of this whole series on global and under conflict we have been discussing over exploitation of natural resources and in what ways this exploitation is causing problem for the biodiversity as well as the forest growth keep that in mind and then please try to contextualize what uh, kanal pranachandra is trying to suggest that along with those traditional primary reasons of conflict between human and wildlife there have been some unintended reasons and that are uh, absolutely new insight to me as well the conservation efforts have uh, created that possibility where now uh, wildlife is uh, spilling over from the protected areas into the neighboring areas and then the conflict is taking place which means the protection efforts of government ngo civil societies have led to a situation where it has not only been protected but now they are growing and this growth in number is perhaps the other intended reason where we locate uh, the issues of uh, human wildlife conflict to extend my argument uh, what are the main protagonist as we were discussing that we can possibly classify them into two part one is herbivorous and another is uh, carnivorous and uh, un, uh, unfortunately most of the time we see that the human wildlife conflict is basically seen in terms of when a carnivorous attacks but as kanal prachandra was discussing with me in the uh, beginning that there is a herbivorous component also there are uh, wild animals who are not carnivorous but they are major source of uh, human wildlife conflict so sir what is your uh, take on the other protagonist or the main protagonist who are basically herbivorous like as you saying monkeys bulu bulls etc so how will you elaborate that um yes as you have rightly said uh conflict uh, man animal conflict is not mainly centered towards a man tiger conflict or a man leopard conflict uh what we are facing with a much more in a bigger way is a conflict uh, with monkeys menace right sir that is number one secondly is uh, in the field areas in the um, um 
rural areas there is a problem which the farmers face is the um, um, uh, depredation of the your fields uh, uh, cultivated land by uh, blue bulls and uh, uh, wild boars or yeah, wild pigs yes. and uh, they are creating lot of uh, problem uh, now apart from that uh, herbivores you can also categorize as your uh, uh, elephants yes elephants is a very big uh, issue yeah. uh, because uh, while a normal citizen can deal with monkeys and blue bulls and the wild boars but it becomes difficult to deal with the elephants yeah. but elephants are basically located at the places where you find the elephant corridors are there and yeah. there you have got this kind of a problem right. uh now this problem to an extent to to a large extent is attributable to the humans only okay uh basically because uh, as you said that initially that we associate ourselves with the uh, hanuman or uh, jatayu and uh, um, um, uh, idols uh, uh, tiger idols or lion yeah. idols and things like that so same is the case here that the monkeys uh the menace is purely is our fault we have made monkeys uh, beggars in fact yes. uh, by offering them food now what has happened is that the monkey instead of going and looking for a natural food source in the forest he finds it very easy to come out on the edge of the forest go to the human areas and he will be fed uh similarly you see the monkeys also on the national highways and things like that when you are commuting from place a to place b and when the uh, uh, highway passes through the forest you find the monkeys are there on the edge of the road and there are so many monkey kills that time because of the over speeding uh, um, vehicles uh but it is who it is we who have made them this uh, uh, beggars that they start coming and they start begging for the food from us now once they don't get the food then they start grabbing into us they start gra grabbing into our houses they start grabbing the people going up uh, uh, passing by and uh, uh, the, uh, the monkey menace starts uh, similarly blue bulls now blue bulls uh, are more popularly known as neel gai mm. now gai is a uh, uh, is a oli cow yes, uh, so uh, it is a neel gai although it's an antelope it's not a, a cow yeah. uh but uh, just because the word guy has been associated so there is a lot of religious uh, sentiments involved with it that it cannot be killed and as a result uh, the neel gai population has also grown and of course the government ordinance is also there not to be killed because yes. being a wild animal so uh, they are creating lot of problem and so is the wild boars uh, which are there now coming on to the elephants yeah. uh elephants uh, by nature has been a migratory animal which requires large spaces yes uh now that large space uh, has been fragmented by uh you have got uh, tea gardens coming in between you've got cuff coffee gardens coming in between like you are seeing in south india or you are seeing even in the north bengal region of uh, uh jalpaiguri siliguri and yeah. that side uh, darjeeling side uh you have got these uh, plantations there in route uh so the elephants when they move they perforce come into these uh, uh, plantations and uh, they start uh, creating a problem there and come into the contact with the humans and you have human conflicts uh secondly is uh, the sometimes uh, uh, inadvertently uh, without uh, by default uh, but not by design uh, we have made certain reservoirs by uh, creating dams in the rivers and things like that flowing yeah. out of the forest now these dams and reservoirs some of them have been made at the periphery of the forest outside the protected area yes now elephant by nature uh, gets drawn to the uh, water source uh, once it gets drawn to the water source it comes to that reservoir uh, to drink water and uh, it requires lot of water for its sustenance and when it does that it goes into the neighboring fields and does the damage there 
so uh, that's another uh, problem which is there so these are the basically mainly human uh, uh, herbivorous uh, conflicts mm. and uh, you you'd ask for that uh, carnivore also that we'll discuss perhaps in the next lecture yeah. uh, but at the moment you have raised few very pertinent points and which uh, needs to be elaborated when we discuss human wildlife conflict especially as part of larger global environmental conflict one of the point which you mentioned is the fragmented forests that is very important what is fragmented forest how would you explain that because for a layman a forest is a forest what do you mean by fragmented forest and especially when seen in the context of migratory uh, tendencies of elephant why it is very important to have a large chunk of forested area rather than having pieces of that and uh, the fragmented forest in another way as a historian i will say that these are important that there is there is a patch in karnataka there is a patch in sikkim there is a patch in assam there is a patch in jammu and kashmir so what is the problem in having fragmented forest so i am asking two primary questions what is fragmented forest and if there is fragmented forest what are the problems why you are seeing that fragmented forest are creating uh, or aggravating a human wildlife conflict uh firstly fragmented forests uh, are not that they are fragmented forest uh, a patch in sikkim and a patch in uh, central india or patch in karnataka no not that not that it is uh, that corridor the forest corridor which is available now if you see uh, south india uh, the corridor which is available which is available right from karnataka uh, from uh, you can say um, mysore onwards uh, it, it 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 even goes further up in the north in north on the other side but if you go to the mysore mysore say you come and traverse towards your Karna, uh, tamil nadu into the madumalai forest and then you further go down uh, into tamil nadu satyamangalam you go further down you come to the um, periyar tiger reserve so you find that there is a long belt of forest mm. which is extending from karnataka to tamil nadu and then thereafter to the uh, kerala right. uh, this is the western ghats okay now similarly you have got northern uh, uh, landscape also which is your uh, uh, lower himalayas yeah. uh, uh um, say pili bheet side and uh, which extends uh, uh, right from the uh, pili bheet then it goes to dudwa then goes to valmiki in bihar side and it further goes uh, up towards nepal side mm -hmm. and, and so these are the big corridors available then the third corridor is uh, a shivalik corridors uh, which again yes. touches them so these are the long corridors which have been traditionally there as a long forested areas now these landscapes have been over a period of time inadvertently without a a, a long time gain a long time uh, perspective which was thought of at that, that time uh, got fragmented by uh, such industrialization has come in they have been cut across by national highways and state mm. highways uh, whenever it gets cut across by national highways or state highways any uh there is any mode of communication uh, uh, cutting across the forest so along the communication line comes uh, your uh, habitation of humans yes. so uh, human villages they get formed on to the next to the roads then they rapidly in, um, they uh, increase in size and becomes towns so that way what has happened is the, these corridors or these forested areas have been now fragmented into small 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 little pockets with the uh, human uh, um, elements uh, in between to be surprised uh, um, 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 in the complete india landscape uh, there is only 4% is the total area of protected area of forest in the india okay merely 4% uh, merely 4% in fact uh, uh green mission uh, india also is envisaged that by 2020 to increase the forested cover by uh, 5 million hectares okay. uh, uh with the states are working on to it as to how to go about it so basically the uh, these are the small fragments which has taken place now how does it affect is that as i said ki that every animal everything has got a behavior pattern hmm. uh and they are governed by uh, a food chain uh, in the sense 
uh, a, a smaller animal then then it comes a bigger carnivore animal then uh, uh, another so it becomes a kind of a uh, it's a cycle of life yes now this cycle of life to sustain itself requires a land okay and it requires a land which is uh, uh, not disturbed yeah. so uh, now when it doesn't find that in that small little area it spills it comes out and that is a time when you have got these conflicts all right uh, kanchandra the other point which you have raised and that is very important for us to once again revisit human attitude and particularly when we discuss the menace of uh, monkeys uh, recently in the last week himachal pradesh government had declared a uh, uh, price on the killing of animals especially the monkeys and uh, uh, what i'm trying to understand is that on the one hand human atti- attitude is problematic for the conservation or protection of wildlife on the other hand the government efforts of conservation is also leading to spill over of the uh, wildlife and which is creating problem so in that context where will you place the uh, you, you discuss uh, the the blue bull the neel guy the guy is attached so it's sacrosanct it's sacred similarly the monkeys not only the wildlife of uh, any distant part place even the heartland of uh, capital of india is clearly time and again violated by the uh, menace of monkeys so what is the take on this where will you place the 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 the, the human efforts should we re- confine them to the forested areas or should we modify our understanding of conservation efforts or should we modify our attitude towards animal where do you see a, a kind of solution which can address to the growing pop, uh, conflict of human versus uh, wildlife at the moment um you are very correct uh, the most important thing is that uh, we have to make public aware of this problem okay uh, we have to make the people aware ki bhai uh, what is causing this problem yeah. uh if we make the people aware what the causing of the problem the problem gets mitigated over a period of a short time uh, otherwise uh, we continue inviting more problem to ourselves okay and now uh, uh, how can it be dealt with uh, of course what uh, we have seen that limited culling hmm. is also a solution because uh, you cannot help it but it's inevitable because it has grown into such large uh, numbers yeah. uh, that it's creating a nuisance uh, uh let's not go into the emotional factor of it let's not go into the sentimental factor of it ki why it has happened but why it has happened it has happened because of our fault but now we let's bring it to a, a acceptable level at the same time to make people aware ki what are our responsibilities towards the these wild animals right. now uh, bad luck is that the monkeys uh you cannot term them as either wildlife yeah. or uh, this thing they have become more of a they are not even domesticated but they are kind of a domesticated we have accepted them yes uh into our uh, this thing so uh since we have accepted them then there is a uh, always this tendency of feeding them all or uh, looking after them providing them water and then com- compounded with that uh, is your religious uh, sentiments, uh, sentiments. Yeah. so if in case we make the people aware now i'll tell you another example uh, slightly digressing from this thing is at the moment we don't have the problem of deers yes uh, to that extent that they are getting uh, uh, they are coming out uh, uh, they are accepting humans yeah. not not there but uh, i have seen particularly in southern india uh, in the forest of bandipur madhi malai and all those places where you have got a regular you can't help it that's a national highway so you have got people moving into the vehicles and things through that and they go through this heart of the uh, core areas of these forests and where i now i started noticing over the last four or five years that there are certain deers you will find them op- almost standing on the edge of the road okay and they are looking at you with an intent right and if you stop your vehicle and if you try to give them a food they will be hesitating but if you consist persist there for 3 or 4 minutes they approach quietly to you 
and they approach and then they take the food and go back. Agreed. Now, what has happened is, we are again, we are making them uh, weak. We are uh, changing their patterns yeah. by just by without realizing we are feeling very nice about it but uh, uh, we are not realizing that uh, uh, it is becoming little too friendly to us yes. now when it comes too friendly to us then there's no uh, guarantee that it, it will not be dragged inside the vehicle Obviously. by a person who wants to uh, whatever reason yeah. uh, and people may be doing it also and uh, similarly uh, so this baiting kind of a thing can also begin with that. Apart from that, you know, the pattern of the uh, uh, carnivores also change because carnivore also understands ki by the, uh, it is at these places it will find these uh, herbivores available. Yes. and available and then they will be also concentrating there. So once they will start concentrating there, they will also start accepting the humans because they understand humans will not do anything. And th that is a time when they know that this deer will be vulnerable, they will attack and they will kill. So uh, again, I am trying, 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 trying is that we are again going wrong into this thing. If we make people aware, there are NGOs, I am yeah. very happy. There are NGOs who are there, who are working on the ground, who are trying to tell people because people actually, nobody is trying to do it uh, with a purpose. It is by default. It is by default. Agreed. Agreed. We are not aware of the problem of the human behavior, the animal behavior as well. Uh, uh, as uh, norm of the UCCEC, we have to break for uh, two, three minutes and then re reassemble. When we reassemble, then I will be extending this discussion into the other issues of food chain, especially the, uh, the conservation efforts have in a way protected the predators indirectly protecting the herbivores and then these herbivores are spilling over. So, we will be discussing that when we meet next after a gap of 2 or 3 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Welcome back and to extend our discussion which we have been continuing with Colonel Pranachandra uh, on the issue of human wildlife conflict. Let me uh, 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 create a different context in which we are trying to argue this issue. Uh, during the colonial expansion, during the British period, the Britishers in their attempt to expand the agriculture and the productive uh, raw material for their textile industry back in England, they were extending the agriculture frontiers and for that there are clear documents where they had sponsored killing of carnivorous. If you uh, kill a mother cab, uh, if you kill a mother female, then this is the price. If you uh, kill a cab, this is the price. And if you kill a male, then this is the price. A very systematic effort was done by the uh, British administrator to expand the base of agriculture. What was happening with the expansion in the agriculture, you were reducing the forest. So the inevitability was there that the, the forest dwellers now come in conflict with the nature. The issue which bothers me and where I would like to have a comment from the Colonel Chandra is that with the elimination of carnivorous, do we see proliferation of herbivorous? And let me also argue uh, by giving you an example from my uh, area of research at Rajasthan. The Bishnois, they protected the deer and because they were protecting the deer, initially it was a different kind of livelihood pattern for human civilization. They were basically living as a pastoralist, so a wild patch is available. Now what is happening that they are now becoming settled agriculture. With this settled agriculture, you are converting the wild into agriculture land. With that, you are pushing back the boundaries of forest. You are reducing the forest available to the wildlife. This is also creating problem for the Bishnois themselves to a limited extent that with the availability of limited our wild and expansion in agriculture, along with that protected wildlife, especially the deer and blue uh, and the black buck, etc, etc. Now they are coming in on the fields of uh, Vishnois, those who are now converting the, themselves from the uh, pastoralists to agriculturalists. So it is not only change in the behavior of the animals, it is the change in the behavior of humans that is also affecting, that is also perhaps aggravating the human wildlife conflict, especially when we see that earlier the settlement was confined to patches of uh, settlement in the for ocean of forest. Now it is ocean of agriculture in the patches of forest. So in this context, especially when British has eliminated the carnivorous and this term continued, we have in the last lecture I had discussed the elimination of uh, uh, these uh, cheetahs from India, the extension of cheetahs, extensive hunting of lion, extensive hunting of tigers, leopards. So much so that it was termed as trophy for the uh, shooter. So this attitude has to, uh, in my understanding, has changed the composition between predator, the carnivorous and the herbivorous. So how do you see, Colonel Chandra, how do you see, because your experience in the field of Jammu Kashmir, you have been into Gangtok area and the Sikkim, and you have also been to Central uh, Forest of India. So do you see that the, there is a limited availability of carnivorous and extension or proliferation of herbivorous? Can we uh, reduce it to that kind of uh, argument? Uh, no, you are very true. You are very true. Uh, there has been a, a very, very uh, marked increase in the population of herbivorous animals. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and, and simultaneously, there has been a decrease into the carnivorous yes. animal. Uh, one of the major uh, factor you have said that uh, in earlier times, uh, during the British Raj and when the hunting was a, a major sport. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, lot, lots of these wild uh, carnivorous animals especially were hunted down for trophies and uh, uh, things like that. Uh, apart from that, there was a requirement also to hunt them because uh, the Britishers were uh, colonizing the uh, forests and they were bringing it the agriculture belt. They were the one who brought in tea and yeah. things like that. Uh, uh, those gardens were being created and they, they were coming into much into confrontation when these tigers and other uh, leopards and other um, carnivorous animals were eliminated. Uh, but uh, that is the reason but the simultaneously the major important reason which is the mother reason for everything is the uh, your uh, uh, 
एक डेवलपमेंट इन द कंट्री इकोनॉमिक डेवलपमेंट विच हैज क्रिएटेड मोर ऑफ अर्बनाइजेशन एंड थिंग्स लाइक दैट सो दैट हैज फर्दर शॉर्ट एंड द साइजेज ऑफ द फॉरेस्ट ऑफ फ्रेगमेंटेड दम नाउ द थिंग विच इट्स द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग इज दैट वी हैव टू अंडरस्टैंड द बिहेवियर पैटर्न ऑफ द एनिमल अडेप्टेबिलिटी ऑफ द एनिमल वाइल अ कार्निवोर लाइक अ लेपर्ड इज प्रेटी अडेप्टेबल टू द ह्यूमन्स इट हैज शोन इट्स सेल्फ इट मे बी स्टेइंग इन माई नेबरहुड आई मे नॉट बी अवेयर ऑफ इट वी विल डिस्कस इट आई थिंक इन द नेक्स्ट क्लास नेक्स्ट सेशन वेन वी विल टेक ऑन दैट सो लेपर्ड इज वन थिंग विच इज अडेप्टेड इट्स बट टाइगर कांट टाइगर कांट a black bear or sloth bear can't hmm. uh, it cannot uh, herbivorous animals they can adapt themselves hmm. in fact even now also if you go to the forest areas you will find ki wherever there is a forest uh, checkpoint or a range officers office or a, a place where the uh, people are allowed a guest rooms and things like that which little got a Uh, some human elements around you will find late in the evening just before dark you a lot of congregation of deers coming in there yes and they will remain there till early morning and then they will disperse as the uh, uh, dawn breaks why why is it so because they have understood and they have adapted to the humans they find themselves more secure coming to the places where humans are there and uh, uh, because they understand that the carnivore may not come there to attack think, and to yes. kill it so what has happened is that over a period of time in the agriculture fields and things like that uh, we have got these herbivores which are growing and their population is growing coupled with this is uh, your uh, conservation effort by the government uh, very strict laws uh on uh, hunting and things like that we have seen plenty of cases we have seen plenty of cases of uh, celebrities even not being uh, uh, spared, uh, spared. Yes. Uh, so uh, that is a kind of a strong message which the government is sending and uh, uh, as a result uh, um, their their population is increasing so uh, that's why you find more of a uh, herbivorous and carnivores in the sense uh, you may find a stray tiger or thing like yeah. that leopards may be there but leopard also finds it little difficult to kill a herbivore it, it, it find little more easier to ki- pick up a stray dog yes so uh, that is also to, uh, so the basically that is the reason when the situation is such uh, is being uh, developed uh, where the herbivores can uh, grow in their population so they are growing Let me uh, take a diversion, and uh, uh, and depending on your expertise and your negotiation, which I have also witnessed when you were in uh, Gangtok, uh, what is the role of uh, reduction in the biodiversity in the uh, possible uh, reason for the human wildlife conflict? What I am trying to suggest is that the pandas they depend on a particular kind of species of tree. if those trees are not available then perhaps it becomes difficult for them to survive so the elimination of biodiversity especially britishers while laying the railways they cut down the forest to a great extent and which led to to a great extent monocropping and that monocropping eliminated possibilities of various kinds of herbivores to survive and then they were venturing out from their forest on the one hand and secondly with the perhaps may not be the part of discussion today but if possible and you are willing to comment on that the global warming and its impact on the elimination of biodiversity especially when you see different parts of india you have been northeast you have been in shivaliks you have been in the karnataka region you have been into the central uh, forests of india so do you see any 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 in a way that in what ways elimination of biodiversity elimination of particular kind of tree or grass or particular sustenance on which herbivores or carnivores were depending their elimination is it also responsible for the growth in the human wildlife conflict can you uh, give any an example on that con- uh, on that uh, count uh, 
Yes, uh, you are very right. Uh, they come into the conflict, but more so if you are talking in terms of uh, Himalayan region, you talked about Gangtok and Sikkim as such. Uh, there, uh, it is not coming into the conflict, but they are disappearing. Okay. They are disappearing because the kind of a terrain, the kind of a forest which they require hmm. is not there. Okay. Or, or, or simultaneously, the kind of a behavior. No, red panda you talked about. Red panda is a very shy animal. Hmm. It's a very shy animal. Uh, it remains at a quite a high altitude. Its metabolic rate in the body is very slow. Uh, it does not move around so fast. It's, it sleeps. Uh, bulk of the time it is sleeping or it is eating those bamboo shoots uh, mm. and those kind of things. Uh, and it remains aloof. It remains uh, in its own uh, area. Uh, now, with the, what is happening is that the as and when um, habitat um, humans are uh, settlements are increasing, especially on the roads uh, as such. So you have got those like uh, you talk about Sikkim. So Sikkim, I will say, and uh, uh, others also in the Himalayan region, uh, is basically uh, road construction companies. Mm, yes. Now, road construction companies, wherever they are constructing the road, they are not only constructing the road, they are also maintaining the road. Mm. To maintain the road, you have got those labor camps. Now, those labor camps are becoming a small little settlements all yes. over the uh, yes. uh, these roads. Now, uh, along with the human settlements comes the element of the dogs. Yeah. Now, these dogs, uh, stray dogs, uh, becomes a kind of a feral dog because daytime they look like an absolutely normal, uh, well-behaved dog. But as the dog goes, the same dogs became, becomes a menace to not only uh, to the wild animals, to the humans also. Mm -hmm. There have been plenty of uh, incidents where these wild dogs have... Uh, killed uh, uh, labor's children or they have uh, killed even uh, people also moving alone on the road and uh, some instances of eating them also have taken place. So this feral dogs uh, have been the creation of these human settlements. Mm. Now these feral dogs are the dogs which are moving into the neighboring areas and they are depleting the natural wildlife. Okay. Uh, a single example is that uh, uh, I, I have seen uh, I, I, in my lifetime I have seen only once uh, uh, besides the point that uh, I have stayed in Sikkim for almost Sikkim six years I have seen the uh, red panda in wild only once only and that too also in a massive extensive search that was in uh, 2009. And uh, the sad part is that about seven or eight days later, I was uh, I came to learn. I I was told that a red panda a red panda was found killed uh, in this near vicinity, and it happened to be the same panda because that panda was not seen again. And the bad part was that the the panda was killed by a dog. Oh, no, 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 na, na, no part of the panda was eaten by the dog. It was just the dog was uh, furious. It, it was uh, it, it just in fury. It has killed the red panda. Okay. Now, what happens is that as and when any human encroaches into the forest area, whenever they go inside, these dogs follow. Yeah. Uh, dogs have got the habit of follow. Now, we come back or the humans come back. Without realizing that the dog has seen the forest and it has seen the deers there, mm. it has seen the red panda there. Now it comes back and then it goes again in okay. just fury to go and kill the animal and comes back. So this is a big problem there. And of course the humans coming into that area, so that has depleted the uh, uh, habitation right. of the pandas, which has created the problem. Kunjinda, the other issue which we have not yet discussed, not yet touched upon, and perhaps we may discuss that in our next uh, lecture tomorrow. But at the moment, what is the role of poaching? Because we most of the time we see poaching of elephant and the poaching of tiger for his skin, for uh, their uh, tusk. So what is the role of poaching in aggravating the human wildlife conflict on the one hand? And what is the role of local communities who have been traditionally living in the forested areas and perhaps working as safeguard? 
because there is a conflict, there is a, there's a uh, uh, diversion of uh, views with respect to conservation of forests or conservation of wildlife that these settlements which have been living in tradition, traditionally, they were working as safeguard and with the poachers now it is open for them because there is no local presence, there is no human presence in the forest. So, poaching versus local communities. What is your understanding or what is your has, what has been your experience in uh, issues of human wildlife conflict? Where do you locate these two issues, poaching and the role of local communities? Mm. Uh, there are two kinds of poachers. The poachers which come from outside and do the poaching and go back. Okay. And the second type of poachers are who are staying there only, uh, traditionally uh, criminals uh, in that local area, uh, who do the poaching. Uh, however, what you have said is uh, uh, is absolutely right that the local people, if publicly they made aware, yeah. and they are uh, in they are giving encouragements yeah. uh, in terms of uh, com not compensation. I will not call it compensation, but award or yes. a reward for uh, letting us know. Yeah. So uh, they come up and they should get a feeling of. Uh, pride ki that uh, we are living in this forest and we are living this forest along with uh, such great animals like elephants, tigers, leopards and uh, bear and those kind of things. Yes. So uh, they should have that kind of uh, pride that, that has to be built into them. Then they come up uh, with these kind of things and they help us in uh, finding out ki if there is any poaching around or no. Uh, for anybody, whether uh, it is the person coming from outside to do the poaching or it is the person from inside, inside who is doing the poaching. It requires a internal support. Okay. Without internal support, it cannot be done. So, that internal support if in case cut off, is, is cut hmm. by the people who are staying there. So, then poaching gets minimized. Agreed. And uh, poaching to quite an extent has got minimized uh, in the sense uh, uh, it has reduced quite a bit. But still there are stray incidents of uh, poaching takes place uh, in terms of uh, uh, rhinoceroses in uh, Kaziranga or tigers uh, in central India. Uh, Some odd cases have been seen. Uh, there have been cases of uh, certain species which we never knew about as being uh, poached uh, maximum is like pangolins. Uh, yes. Uh, they are being poached uh, and they are uh, snakes uh, yeah. are being poached, uh, frogs are being poached. Uh, so, uh, those things are taking place but uh, it has been reduced and uh, uh, with our kind of uh, internal net network, uh, internet intelligence network available and with the help of the cooperation of the people. Mm. Uh, it has been a success. Agreed. Totally agree with you. The other issue which you were raising that with the construction of uh, roads and the expansion of human settlement. Uh, recently, uh, WTI, World, uh, World uh, Wildlife Trust of India is working on Markhor, the mountain goats. And what they have documented is with, with the uh, reopening of and the widening of old Mughal highway to Srinagar, the mountain goats who were living uh, towards the base of the mountain now they are moving into the interiors and the interiors are not suitable for them. But with the expansion of uh, road network because we are linking uh, expanding the connectivity, the, the mountain goats are feeling the pressure and they are moving into the higher altitudes where perhaps for them the enough vegetation is not available. So th these are issues I totally agree with you and uh, mm. totally uh, sympathize with the uh, problem which, which we are creating for the wildlife. The other issue which I have been uh, trying to discuss and uh, you have been commenting on that. Let me let me uh, explore that if you can comment on uh, the issue of distribution of water. Especially uh, if I give you example of Ghana wildlife century, the uh, very near to Delhi, the Bharatpur wildlife century, there has been conflict or the uh, protest by the peasant that you should not transfer water to the uh, wildlife century, rather you should transfer this water to the human settlement for agriculture purposes. And once again that is the old debate, expansion of agriculture, requirement of irrigation. So do you see this kind of conflict in the mountainous region as well, where the availability of water, especially in the winter season becomes a problem. So is there any effort by the government to create water bodies, secure water bodies and 
are they working in the elimination of human wildlife conflict or they are aggravating human wildlife conflict especially when we keep uh, water as a resource in mind because it's a primary requirement for the animals as well as for the humans uh mainly concerning with the uh, limiting my comments on to the mountains and uh, and to what to the extent what i have seen yeah uh, i am not a spokesperson for anybody but what i have seen in mountains uh, whatever water schemes or water uh, dams and things are being constructed is cons being constructed purely keeping into the consideration the requirement of the human settlements yes. and the development envisaged in that thing uh, the uh, impact on the wildlife to quite a extent has been negated Okay. It, it it has not been taken care to that extent mm. and uh, uh, to that score uh, uh, of course uh, it is uh, making the uh, not only making the complete uh, mountains fragile and more prone to landslides and things like that uh, uh, it is depleting the strength of the uh, uh, wildlife also and wildlife is being pushed uh, mm. to quite an extent inside uh, that is true uh, so in mountains the it is purely being done for the requirement, requirement of the humans. Uh, humans and and more so not only humans it is basically for the power generation okay yes it is for the power, power generation, generation. Uh, the series of dams which have come up uh, in uh, uh, sikkim yeah. uh, and creating uh, we are seeing every uh, so much of uh, problems which takes place the uh, massive earthquake which shook uh, gangtok uh, yeah. 2011 or so 2010 or 10, 11 yes. 2010 or 11 that is one of the reason for that so those things are taking place uh, and that is the price which we are paying for water agreed but it's a it's a very difficult and it's a very um, uh, it requires a very concerted effort to balance the thing as to uh, how much do you want in the name of uh, economic development and how much do you want to uh, yes um, keep your uh, uh, environment safe and secure uh it's a very important thing and uh, this point leads me to, to the, my last question for today but before i ask that last question to you let me remind my viewers that tomorrow when we will meet colonel chandra we will be uh, showing you if possible few clips of case studies of how to manage how to mitigate human wildlife conflicts and these are real life stories which colonel pranay chandra has documented and we will be sharing that tomorrow but before concluding let me ask you were discussing something something on the uh, economic aspect of uh, development and as we were discussing and we have seen in the documents uh, and the bibliography which we are uh, giving you that bibliography also tells you uh, enough cases of the role of tourism in mitigating these conflicts because the livelihoods are uh, challenged livelihoods are disturbed when we protect the areas or we uh, don't allow any kind of economic activities in the activities in the protected areas what is the role of tourism because perhaps tourism becomes or offers uh, some kind of livelihood to the local inhabitants who are being disturbed or who are being displaced by construction of protected areas which are perhaps very necessary for the conservation of wildlife so what is the role of tourism if you can comment of that then that will be very uh, limiting for us uh tourism plays a very important role in fact tourism uh, uh in spite of giving livelihood it is also uh, is an as an alternative i to the government uh, to know as to what is the uh, um, uh, checks and balances yes. what are being happening into the forest area uh so tourism plays a very very important role in conservation of the wildlife uh it gives a kind of it's it's a it's a big revenue generation uh, a tool available yes. uh, for the local settlements now uh, we, uh, the tourist who wants to go to the forest they are looking for solitude they are looking for that kind of a rural area now if the locals uh, can provide that kind of a small little space for the tourism and can invite the tourist in a limited manner so that they can not they should not become a nuisance and they should not uh, uh, become a um, uh, privacy they should not yeah. uh, um, i mean to say disturb the privacy of the forest and they should uh, um, so uh, 
it's a it's a big thing uh, any tourist i will much rather like to go and stay with a tribal in his house and eat his uh, kind of a uh, food yeah. and uh, uh, and he he takes me around and he shows me those wildlife around and he shows me as to how to sustain uh, that is much more enlightening to me and will be i will be much more enjoying in that Absolutely. than uh, anywhere else so uh, tourism uh, has a great uh, exponent so before concluding today's uh, discussion let me just bring a uh, point out to the viewers that gujarat has been very reluctant to share its land the asiatic land which are preserved in the gir forest they are very reluctant to share because that is a major source of revenue generation for them with these comment let me conclude today's session and let me thank kanal chandra for his uh, insight on these issues and uh, hopefully we will have a discussion extending this to the carnivorous tomorrow thank you very much kanal chandra thank you thank you so much man thank you viewers